Kepler's second law of planetary motion states that a line joining any planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas during equal intervals of time. As seen in this clip, as the planet moves away from the sun it slows down, allowing these equal areas to be swept out. Just as Kepler stated, no matter where along the orbit a planet is, the area swept out by the line joining the planet and the sun is constant. The first step in proving the second law is to show that the h vector is equal to the radius squared multiplied by the change in theta with respect to time in the k-hat direction. In this case, the h vector is a constant vector that is equal to the position vector crossed with the velocity vector. And because the velocity vector is equal to the derivative of the position vector, the h vector is really equal to the position vector crossed with the derivative of the position vector. The position was given to us as r cos theta in the x and r sin theta in the y, so the velocity is negative r sin theta d theta by dt in the x and r cos theta d theta by dt in the y. After crossing the two vectors and simplifying using simple trigonometric identities, it is found that r cross r prime, which is equal to h, is equal to r squared d theta by dt in the k-hat direction. After doing a little digging, it is found that the h vector is perpendicular to both the velocity and position. The k-direction is also perpendicular to both the velocity and posi position so h can be written as simply r squared d theta by dt. The next step on our quest to prove sec Kepler's second law is to find an expression for the area swept out as time changes. The area swept out can be approximated by the area of part of a circle, which equals 1 half r squared delta theta. To be more accurate, we want to slice up our circle portion into infinitely many small pieces, then add up all of these small pieces to give us the total area. This is a Riemann sum, and thus the area can be written as the integral of 1 half r squared d theta. By then taking the derivative with respect to t of both sides, we get our final equation. dA by dt is equal to 1 half r squared d theta by dt. Finally, we just have to put together our two formulas like peanut butter and jam to prove Kepler's second law. To do this, we just have to take one of our two formulas, as shown here, and sub it into the other one, thus eliminating the d theta by dt term and receiving just the change in area with respect to time. If we isolate for r squared in the second term and then sub that into the first formula, we get the equation shown on the bottom on the screen. After a little cleaning up, we find that the change in area with respect to time is equal to 1 half h. 1 half h is just a constant, so this equation proves that the line between the sun and a planet sweeps out equal areas over constant times. Kepler's third law, the law of periods, shows that the time required for a planet to travel all the way around the sun is proportional to the average distance the planet is from the sun. It also implies that a planet located further away from the sun will take longer to orbit, will travel a greater overall distance, and will travel at an average slower speed than a planet closer to the sun. To prove Kepler's third law, we must first find a relationship that proves the period of orbit. We start with our equation from the second law, rearrange it to get dt and dA on opposite sides, and then integrate. We integrate to get the relationship of A and T with respect to H. Knowing that the area of an ellipse is equal to pi times A times B, we can then sub that into our period equation to get T equals 2 pi AB divided by H where a and b are the major and minor axes. In the Stuart text, we are given these four equations relating the major and minor axes, 
and E and D. Using these four equations, we can manipulate them to come out with the following relationships, where ED is equal to H squared divided by GM, and ED is equal to B squared over A. Finally, using our two derived equations, we can prove Kepler's third law. This is done by squaring the period function, as seen in the above equation, and then subbing the b squared function, seen below, into the newly squared function. After reducing and simplifying, we are given the shown function, which is Kepler's third law.